Stalin, Section, Terror Famines in the History of the Liberal West. Moreover, besides distorting history, what completely invalidates the discourse by the Cold War veteran is his silence. One can start with a debate that occurs in the House of Commons on October 28, 1948. Churchill denounces the widening conflict between Hindus and Muslims and the horrible holocaust that is overtaking India after independence was conceded by the Labour government, and after the dismantlement of the British Empire. Then a Labour MP interrupted the speaker, quote, Why don't you talk about the famine in India? The former Prime Minister tries to avoid it, but his interlocutor insists, quote, Why don't you speak of the famine in India? that the previous conservative government had been responsible for." End quote. The reference is to the famine, stubbornly denied by Churchill, that, from 1943 to 44, caused three million deaths in Bengal. Neither of the two sides remember, however, the famine that took place some decades earlier, also in colonial India. In this case, it's 20 to 30 million people who lose their lives. Often forced to carry out hard labor, with a diet inferior to that provided to the prisoners of the infamous Buchenwald lager. On this occasion, the racist component was explicit and declared. The British bureaucrats said that it was, quote, a mistake to spend so much money to save a lot of black fellows, end quote. On the other hand, according to the viceroy Sir Richard Temple, those who had lost their lives were mostly beggars without any real intention of working. Quote, Nor will many be inclined to grieve much for the fate which they brought upon themselves, and which terminated lives of idleness and too often of crime. End quote. With World War II over, Sir Victor Golansk, a Jew who arrived in England after having fled anti-Semitic persecution in Germany, publishes the Ethics of Starvation in 1946, and In Darkest Germany a year later. The author denounces the policy of hunger that, after the defeat of the Third Reich, befalls prisoners and the German people, continually at risk of death by starvation. Infant mortality was ten times more elevated than in 1944, a year that was particularly tragic. The rations available to the Germans are dangerously close to those enforced in Bergen-Belsen. In the two cases just cited, it's not Soviet Ukraine that is compared to a Nazi concentration camp, but the work camps of British subjugated India and the occupation regime imposed on those defeated by the liberal West. The latter accusation appears more persuasive as is confirmed by the most recent and exhaustive book published on the topic. Quote, the Germans were much better fed in the Soviet zone. End quote. The country that had suffered the genocidal policy of the Third Reich, and because of that policy continued in suffering shortages, was more generous. In effect, what led the liberal West to inflict death by starvation on those it defeated was not a lack of resources, but ideology. Quote, Politicians and the military, like Sir Bernard Montgomery, insist that no food should be sent by Great Britain. Death by starvation was the punishment. Montgomery insisted that three quarters of all Germans were still Nazis. End quote. For exactly that reason, fraternization was prohibited. It was necessary to not give a word and much less a smile to members of a people totally and irredeemably wicked. The American soldier was warned, quote, In heart, body, and soul, every German is Hitler. Even a young woman could prove deadly, quote, Don't be like Samson with Delilah. She would love to cut your hair and then your throat. This hate campaign explicitly sought to remove all sense of compassion and therefore guarantee the success of the, quote, Ethics of Punishment by Starvation. American soldiers should also remain unmoved when faced with starving children, quote, in the blonde-haired German child lurks a Nazi, end quote. If the tragedies of Bengal and Ukraine are explained by the list of priorities dictated by the approach or the intensification of the Second World War, 
which imposes the concentration of limited resources on the struggle against a mortal enemy, then one can speak accurately of a planned terror famine with regards to Germany immediately after the defeat of the Third Reich, where the lack of resources plays no role at all, but is instead influenced to a considerable degree by the racialization of a people, who F.D. Roosevelt, for some period of time, has the temptation of eliminating from the face of the earth by means of castration. One could even say that it was the start of the Cold War that saved the Germans, and the Japanese, or at least noticeably lessened their suffering. In the struggle against the new enemy, they could be useful and valuable cannon fodder, offering their experience to their former enemy. But it is useless to search for any mention of the famine in British colonial India, or of the West's Bergen-Belsen in Germany, in the books by the Cold War veteran, dedicated to pushing through a scheme constructed a priori through historical revisionism. All the Nazi infamies are only the replica of communist infamies. Therefore, the Hitlerian Bergen-Belsen is modeled off the Bergen-Belsen ante litarum, for which Stalin is responsible. Fully coherent with such a scheme, Conquest completely ignores the fact that hunger and the threat of death by starvation is a constant factor in the relations instituted by the West with barbarians, as well as with enemies that are compared to barbarians. After the revolution and Saint Domingo, fearing the political contagion from the first country in the Americas to abolish slavery, Jefferson declares that he's ready to, quote, subject Toussaint to death by starvation, end quote. Tocqueville demands that the crops be burnt and silos emptied should the Arabs dare to resist the French conquest in Algeria. Five decades later, with that same war tactic, which condemns an entire people to hunger or death by starvation, the United States strangulates the resistance in the Philippines. Even when it's not intentionally planned, a famine is an opportunity not to be wasted, in the time period in which Tocqueville seeks to create a desert around the rebellious Arabs. A devastating disease destroys the potato harvest in Ireland and decimates a population already heavily strained by the looting and oppression by English colonizers. In the eyes of Sir Charles Edward Trevelyan, charged by the London government with monitoring and dealing with the situation, the tragedy appears to be the expression of divine providence that thus solves the problem of overpopulation, and also the endemic rebellion of a barbarian population. In this sense, British policy was, at times, classified as proto eichmann protagonists of a tragedy that could be considered the prototype to the genocides of the 20th century. Let's focus on the 20th century, however. The methods traditionally used at the expense of colonized peoples could also be useful in the struggle for hegemony between the great powers. With the outbreak of World War I, Britain subjects Germany to a criminal naval blockade, whose significance Churchill explains in these terms. Quote, the British blockade treats all of Germany as a besieged fort and explicitly intends to reduce the entire population to starvation, thus forcing it into capitulation. Men, women, and children, old and young, the injured and the healthy. End quote. The blockade continues in force for months even after the armistice, and once again it is Churchill who explains the need for the prolonged recourse to that quote, weapon of hunger and even starvation that above all else impacts women and children, the elderly, the weak and the poor. End quote the defeated must fully accept the peace terms of the victors. But with the threatening emergence of Soviet Russia, there's now a different enemy. If Jefferson feared the contagion from the Haitian Revolution, Wilson is worried about containing the Bolshevik Revolution. The methods remain the same. To prevent it possibly following the example of Soviet Russia, Austria, in the words of Gramsci, faces a, quote, brigands blackmail, either bourgeois order or hunger, end quote. In effect, 
Sometime later, it is Herbert Hoover, high representative of the Wilson administration and future U.S. president, who warns Austrian authorities that, quote, any disturbance of public order will make impossible the delivery of food supplies and leave Vienna facing absolute hunger, end quote. And later, it will be the same American politician who offers this summary, in which he explicitly boasts, quote, fear of starving to death kept the Austrian people away from revolution, end quote. As you can see, it's Jefferson and Hoover who explicitly theorize the very terror famine for which conquest denounces Stalin. We are in the presence of a policy that continues unabated in our time. In June of 1996, an article by the director of the Center for Economic and Social Rights highlights the terrible consequences of the collective punishment inflicted on the Iraqi people through the embargo. Quote, More than 500,000 Iraqi children have died of hunger or illness. End quote. Many others were on the brink of suffering the same fate. An unofficial magazine of the State Department, Foreign Affairs, reaches a more general conclusion. After the overthrow of real socialism, in a world unified under the hegemony of the U.S., the embargo constitutes a weapon of mass destruction par excellence. Officially imposed to prevent Saddam Hussein from gaining weapons of mass destruction, the embargo on Iraq, quote, in the years following the Cold War, has caused more deaths than all weapons of mass destruction in history combined. End quote. Therefore, it's as if the Arab country has endured at the same time the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the mustard gas attacks by Wilhelm II and Benito Mussolini, and still yet other examples. In conclusion, the policy of terror famine, for which Stalin is blamed, is deeply embedded in the history of the West, and in the 20th century is first put into practice against the country that emerged out of the October Revolution, and then finds its triumph after the overthrow of the Soviet Union. End section.